can go ahead. Okay. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for joining us. My name is Dr. Natalia Lukasheva. I am Russian Canadian, but for this year, I am the first visiting Nansen Professor of Arctic Studies at the University of Akureyri. A part of my mandate is to promote Arctic issues, and energy is one important topic, more specifically legal and political developments. That's why I offered and organized this session. And more specifically, my interest in energy includes an academic interest. I'm uh, teaching at uh, Osgoode Hall Law School in Canada at the master's program on energy. I'm teaching legal courses there. And I also teach at the Polo Law program at the University of Aquarelli. Uh, I think this session is quite important because no matter what we do with regards to energy resources in the Arctic, you can find linkages with legal and political issues. We heard a lot today about renewable energy and the wealth of knowledge and information on alternative sources of energy in the Arctic and experiences which could be learned further. And today we shall focus a little bit on Icelandic experience when it comes to renewables, but our session is mainly focused on oil and gas developments in the Arctic. And there are several questions that need to be addressed. How do we develop energy resources in the Arctic for the benefit of northerners? Can those resources be developed in sustainable and responsible way? Do we need more cooperation when it comes to technologies or best practices and knowledge sharing practices among the Arctic states or others for further exploration and resource development in the Arctic. So, and of course, since it's legal and political session, what are the gaps or are there any gaps in regulatory frameworks when it comes to energy developments, offshore energy developments, etc. So our session shall address only some of those questions and we hope to have a discussion after all of our speakers uh, have their presentations. Our first speaker is Dr. Um, Gudni Johannesson, who is Director General of the National Energy Authority of Iceland since 2008. This agency is a governmental body under the Ministry of Industry and Innovation, responsible for public administration and regulation of the energy sector in Iceland, including hydropower, geothermal energy, and oil and gas exploration. Uh, Dr. Johannesson, um, for 17 years before uh, joining this position, for 17 years uh, he was full professor in building technology at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and his research included building physics and energy conservation in the built environment. Dr. Johannesson has a Master of Science in Engineering Physics and a PhD in Building Physics from the University of Lund, Sweden. He has several awards, and he is also an affiliated professor um, at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and an adjunct professor at the University of Reykjavik. He is going to talk to us today about energy resources of Iceland, including perspectives of exploration of oil and gas um, in Iceland. Dr. Johannesson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a pleasure to be here with you and uh, share some of the uh, options and experiences we have in Iceland for energy extraction from the ground and from our natural resources. Um, it's, um, I represent Orkustopnun as the, uh, the American ambassador so eloquently said this morning. He, he had learned this word. And this is the National Energy Authority of Iceland. And we have the public administration of the energy sector and we are also advisors to the government, and we work in long-term planning of the energy utilization and the energy system, and we contract and conduct research on research utilization, and we also, which is very important, we accumulate and maintain databases on energy utilization and 
make forecasts for future trends. Uh, we issue all permits for exploration and the utilization of energy and earth-based resources, and we issue the power plant licenses. We are regulators for the national grid, and we are the official monitoring body, of course, for these licenses, and then we administer the fuel sec sec uh, sector and uh, transition to low-carbon fuels, but also we are responsible for trying to extract fuels from the bottom from the seafloor, as I will come later on. And then we have several activities like the Energy Agency for Energy Efficiency. We have the Energy Fund for mitigating search for, for um, uh, geothermal energy and the co mitigating cost for such operations. And uh, we also host the United Nations University for Geothermal Training Program. And this we do with 37 persons. A small institute in a small country has to have uh, many tasks, and we say that our motto is the Swiss Army Knife. That is what we, that was what we go for. And um, so we have the public administration, and we are under the Ministry of Industry and uh, Commerce, was it called this morning? They're, they're changing name all the time, faster than I change my slides. And we are working, of course, on several acts that both concern our institute, but also uh, electricity, energy and mineral resources, water resources, hydrocarbon sources, and the Seafloor Act. So, and then we are, of course, very depending on the environmental uh, and natural resources uh, minist ministry for uh, environmental, environment and natural resources and the laws on, on well, the so-called Master Plan Act, I will come to that, and of course on water governance, municipal planning and nature conservation, and, and then the assessment, environmental impact and, and, uh, and strategic assessment also. So what is special about Iceland is that the ownership of resources is linked to the ownership of land. That means that every Icelander that owns a, a, a plot of land owns this cone down to the center of the earth and all that comes with it. So there is no limit downwards. And, uh, uh, but fortunately, a large part of the country and, and especially a large part of the highlands where the natural resources are, are owned by state and municipalities so this will be somehow publicly controlled to a, to a large extent. And uh, there is a law that says that energy resources cannot be sold from uh, state or municipally owned entities to private uh, partners or private companies. So there is a limit to that. But then an energy company can in, come in and, and, and get a license for either a power plant or extraction of oil or whatever. And uh, this is then time limited and has to be. But of course, for privately owned land, this would be unlimited ownership. But then transmission and distribution of electricity around the country is in carried out by regulated companies. Uh, we have the so-called master plan, and the master plan is a very complex puzzle. We have to go through with our, all our uh, options for larger options for, for uh, hydropower and geothermal power. You apply and you can get a full stop. Uh, that is, this is conserved because of uh, matters for the na of the nature or uh, cultural heritage. You can put on a waiting list, that is, uh, more information is needed, and you can go on on a long journey into environmental impact assessment, and then you make the general plan, get the general plan and the permits from the, from the municipality. You make the exploration, and then you get a utilization li license, and only then you need consent from the landowners that owns the land to the center of the earth. You can get license from me or, or Orkustopnen to carry out research without the consent of the landowner. 
And then, of course, it's a building permit, operational license, and power plant license. This comes in a row, but of course, there is a lot of bureaucracy and there is a considerable amount of time uh, involved in this process. And what is also new since we uh, ratified the Aarhus uh, Convention in, the, uh, uh, in the 2011 is that Aarhus Dobnen no longer works under the Ministry on these issues. We are authorized by the Parliament to carry this out. So we give out research, use utilization licenses, power plant licenses, transmission regulation, distribution regulation, and several other licensed operations we have. And when people or, or our counterparts are not happy with us, they don't complain to the ministry. The ministry has no say. There is a special ruling committee. And if the ruling committee does not rule in the favor, they usually go to to the different stages of court as well. And um, then we have um, electricity regulation, we have a robust system and secure delivery, that is one of our aims. And uh, of course we are trying to provide a competitive environment so that regulation is, is, is uh, uh, the electricity transmission and distribution is regulated, but we are trying to make the system so that power generators can come in and sell into the system freely and in competition. And what is special about our electricity consumption is that if we look at our normal community, uh, that, that is only using, well, the people, uh, the homes and the small and medium uh, companies, they are only consuming about 20% of the total use of electricity. The remaining 80% are sold to industries that have moved their operations to Iceland and invested here to get this green and cost-efficient electricity for their operation, and they are, to the larger part of them, are aluminium smelters. And so our total electricity use is about 17, 18 terawatt hours. Only three of those go to the general use. Uh, the rest go to large industries. And even if we have some backup power in fossil, for fossil fuels, we hardly ever use that. So the annual uh, generation of electricity from fossil fuel is only two gigawatt hours, a very, very small fraction. And about 75% of this comes from uh, hydropower now, 25% uh, from geothermal, but the geothermal uh, part is increasing. And the cost per kilowatt hour is relatively small for our uh, geothermal and our hydropower compared to solar power. Uh, we would be producing electricity for three to four you, kroner, that's about three to four US cents per kilowatt hour in Iceland. Uh, uh, solar energy would cost about 64 uh, kroner here in Iceland. So that is a huge difference from what we can do with, with these, these uh, new technologies. And uh, uh, we see that the prices for heating are very low in Iceland uh, because we are hardly using any oil. Uh, we have the, the bottom, li bottom, uh, bottom line there is the gasoline heating, and we see that it's far more expensive than all other alternatives we have. But if we see the three lines on the top there, this is 90% of the populations are covered by this, and the, 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 the most expensive heating there is six kroner per kilowatt hour. That is relatively small. And uh, we see that uh, we invested very early in this in the 70s. We thought there would be no oil, more, more oil in the world. So large investments were made, of course. When the oil prices went up in the, around 1980, we earned a lot of money, but then the oil prices went down again. But then when the oil prices went up now, our price for heating is only 15% of what it would be if we were using oil for heating our houses. 
And the, uh, I would just say that uh, now, coming back to this master plan, that even if we are producing or generating uh, uh, low cost and uh, uh, renewable electricity in Iceland, it's not generally accepted by all people that we should do that. There are some people that are concerned about the environment and, and of course every operation you make of this size and magnitude, it has some impact on the environment. So we had this master plan where we had all our 80 remaining choices for producing electricity uh, ranked and ordered and uh, we can see from this exercise that uh, we are now producing about uh, 17, 18 terawatt hours of electricity, but uh, uh, we have appropriate for development from this uh, master plan we carried out and was, was uh, accepted by the parliament before. We have about 10 terawatt hours. And then uh, awaiting further consideration, that's on the waiting list, we have more 12 terawatt hours, so we have more waiting than, than, than we already produce. But we see that appropriate for protection, that is about 25 terawatt hours that have already been set aside because of environmental reasons or cultural heritage or other reasons that, that ex exclude these options. So there's a large part remaining which we are not going to use. Now, uh, on top of this abundance of uh, renewable energy, we have the possibility to produce oil and gas. And uh, this is uh, mostly in this uh, uh, so-called Drake area. You see it by the red triangle there. And uh, this is northeast of Iceland in the direction of Jan Mayen. And the bent line there is our border to Norway because this uh, seafloor area has already been negotiated between Iceland and Norway. And um, uh, why, is this, uh, why is this interesting? Well, this is because what we have there is a microcontinent, as we call it. It's a piece of Greenland and Norway when they were lying together some 50, 60 million years ago uh, before they parted. We had this area there, and this has the same geology as the East Greenland and the Norwegian seafloor. So we are, of course, very hopeful that there may be conditions for, for oil and gas uh, sources there. And we have, of course, some legal and regulatory framework. Uh, and uh, this is a rather new law, first 2001. And then uh, uh, the last act is from, uh, and regulation is from 2011 and 2009. So this is very fresh for us. We have been developing these rules. And what we have been doing is, as much as possible, uh, copying the Norwegian regulatory, <coughs> legal and regulatory framework, but of course with the difference that we cannot take so much part in the early uh, prospecting and <coughs> economical part as Norway can do. So we can say that <coughs> the, for those who exploit for oil and gas in our area, the cost for the initial cost is higher but the uh, tax on, on extraction is then a little bit lower. So we hope that will even up. Uh, so all the hydrocarbon accumulations are owned by the Icelandic state and we, Orkestopn licenses, uh, uh, gives license for prospecting, exploration and production of hydrocarbons. Uh, what is very important in all this uh, negotiation with Norway is the so-called Article 6. Article 6 says that uh, uh, Norway can enter with 25% within a certain area on, uh, around the border. On our side, Norway can 
enter with 25% if somebody applies for a license. If we are going to give a license, we send the license to Norway and they decide if they want to take part by 25%. We have a similar clause on the Norwegian side, except that we only have to decide whether to take part or not after the, they have found oil on the Norwegian side. So we don't have to take the economical risk of exploration. So this is an asymmetrical, uh, a, a, a symmetrical uh, negotiation or a negotiation result very much in our favor. Uh, the environmental conditions in this area are uh, even if it's north of the Arctic Circle, uh, the environmental conditions are rather favorable, we might say. We have uh, uh, water depth is, of course, something, something between 800 and 2,000 meters. The, probably the most difficult thing to handle is that the distance of shore is about 12, two to 400 kilometers. But uh, this is some cold oceanic climate, but the Gulf Stream, nicely arriving from Caribbean, from the Caribbean, is, is giving a mean temperature of 10 degrees all year round, uh, uh, 5 to 8 in summer, minus 2 in winter, so it's not very cold winters there. Uh, precipitation is low, and, and uh, the snow is not that very heavy. Mean sp uh, wind speeds are lower than in the North Sea, and also the wave heights are lower than in the North Sea. The only specific problem there is a, a frequent fox in summer, and this can mean some icing during winter. This could affect the, the helicopter traffic. And the edge of the sea ice has been north and west of the area since the cold period, 65 to 71, and the, the uh, sea ice is not considered to be a problem there. Of course, it had been, has to be watched and monitored, but it's not to, to, to uh, believe to affect the production in a, in a large way. Now, this means that even if it's an uh, Arctic uh, area, uh, it does not have the uh, major problems that we see when we have icebergs scraping the bottom or whatever. This is very far from that. And uh, we have a very nice uh, online data information system which can be arrived at from our homepage. So if you want to look at the area and the, the bathymetry or whatever, you can go in there and, and see all, all, all the public information there is, is available on this website. And uh, our second uh, round, our first round was uh, carried out just through the major economical crash and, and the companies that bid for license there, they are not more. And um, so, so that more or less evaporated into thin air. But then we started the other and, and started on 3rd of October 2011. And the uh, deadline for applications was on 2nd of April. And we had three uh, applications, one from an Icelandic company, Acon. And then we had from uh, two foreign companies, Fire Petroleum and Valiant Petroleum, together with Icelandic companies. And Norway decided to participate with 25% in, in two of these licenses, which we could issue directly. The first license we had to give uh, the, the, the uh, applicant opportunity to, to come with uh, a stronger partner which they have done now. And, um, and this is then pending now, and we are trying to finalize. Uh, Acon Energy has now taken the Chinese uh, oil company, Sinuk, as their partner, and uh, they are working on, and we are working on the finalizing their application for, to be sent on to Norway. But as you heard this morning, there is some political turbulence about the Almayan in Norway these days, so we, we don't know if Norway will be interested to, to, to participate in this license, but we have absolutely had no, no uh, official information 
otherwise either. So just looking at the license timelines, we are now in 2013, and uh, this will start with analyzing of data, and uh, we expect explorations well in, in the Federal Petroleum License to be, to be drilled somewhere after 2017 if they find the seismic interesting. And the same applies to Valiant Petroleum, which is now owned by Ithaca Petroleum. And uh, we, we, uh, we expect them to, to uh, start drilling somewhere around 2020, if they, or, or, or of course earlier if they find it interesting. But, but this is the time they have to make the, the seismic. So uh, the interpretation of geology for the Drake area is based on uh, analysis for better known areas on either side of the North Atlantic. And, um, and uh, the key new research which has been done, it proves the presence of pre-opening sed sediments. And the seepage of Jurassic oil has been found in the sediment sample, so we know that there is oil down there, even if we don't know the quantities. And we will continue research in cooperation with Norway uh, as, as much as, as the politics will allow. Uh, this is some development now. We cannot really foresee what will happen, but anyhow, we are not so depending on this for the, these licenses, but of course, our cooperation with Norway has always been very good, and, and we have been very much copying the regular, legal and regulatory framework, and we are cooperating in two licenses already with them. And uh, this granting of exclusive licenses for the exploration and production uh, has been a very important step in the exploration of the area, and we have to look at the fact that five or six years ago, when we were presenting this option in international conferences, people uh, tapped our, our shoulder and said, yes, yes, this is nice. <laughs> but uh, now, this is a reality, and so much of a reality that in Norway now they, they say it has to be stopped. So that, that gives us a, a substance here. Okay, thank you.